The story of Arcus really started in a pond somewhere tens of thousands of years ago. The green stuff that grows on the surface of a pond is primarily an organism called Chlamydomonas reinhardtii, which is an algae. It's a single-celled aquatic plant. I wanted to start here because I think in order to understand Arcus and to understand how it's differentiated from the other technologies, it's important to understand where it came from. And this algae actually figured out how to do gene editing thousands of years before people did. Arcus is based on a naturally occurring gene editing enzyme from Chlamydomonas algae that's called ICRE1. ICRE1 is a member of a larger class of enzymes called homing endonucleases. Homing endonucleases are nature's gene editing technology. So nature doesn't use CRISPR or zinc finger or talon to do gene editing. Nature uses homing endonucleases. And the next few slides, I'm going to show you why that is. The natural job of ICRE1 in the algae is it gets expressed in the cell, and then it hunts through the genome until it finds a particular 22 base pair DNA sequence that shows up in the 23S ribosomal RNA gene. When it finds that site, it binds to it and cuts it. And very, very importantly, as you can see by the, the red scissors in that figure, ICRE1 cuts the top strand of DNA and the bottom strand of DNA offset by four base pairs. What that does is it creates a four base, three prime overhang. So a, a short stretch of DNA that's single-stranded on the three prime end of the cut. Remember that because it's going to be very important a little bit later in the story. After ICRE1 cuts its target site, a new piece of DNA actually gets inserted precisely into that location in the genome. And that new piece of DNA, in fact, encodes the gene encoding ICRE1. So ICRE1 is an example of a selfish DNA. It exists for the sole purpose of inserting a copy of its own gene precisely into this location in the algae genome. So the real takeaway here is ICRE1 is an enzyme that evolved for the purpose of inserting a new gene sequence into a defined location in the genome of a eukaryotic cell with a really, really big genome. The DNA sequence that ICRE1 recognizes that I, I showed you on the previous slide, as far as we know, that sequence doesn't show up anywhere in nature other than the algae genome. So if we want to use ICRE1 to do gene editing uh, in genes that we're interested in, we need to re-engineer it to make it recognize a completely different DNA sequence. The wild type enzyme is a homodimer. So it has a left monomer and a right monomer. The left monomer recognizes the left half of the target site, and the right monomer recognizes the right half of the target site. Because the left monomer and the right monomer are actually identical to one another, they recognize the same DNA sequence, so the left half of the target is basically a mirror image of the right half. What that means is, in order to re-engineer this enzyme to make it recognize a completely different DNA sequence, we actually have to engineer two proteins. We have to re-engineer a first monomer on the left, that's the, the green one on the slide. That recognizes the left half of our new target. And then we have to engineer a completely different second monomer, which is the purple one, that recognizes the right half of the new target site. We then take those two halves of the protein and we fuse them together into a single protein that is expressed from a single gene. And that's what we call Arcus. All of that protein engineering is really pretty involved. And that's because a very significant percentage of the surface area of ICRE1 is, in fact, involved in recognizing and cutting its DNA target, which is a good thing. That means our protein engineers have a lot of surface to work with to optimize the nuclease for its particular function. 
In fact, we know which parts of the protein, we know which amino acids are responsible for controlling the catalytic efficiency of the enzyme, which determines how quickly or slowly the enzyme cuts. We know which amino acids are responsible for binding specificity, which determines what sequence it binds to and what sequence it cuts. And we know which amino acids are responsible for binding affinity, which determine how tightly the enzyme binds to its DNA target and how long it remains bound to the target after it cuts. Those three parameters, efficiency, specificity, and affinity, can actually be fine-tuned independently of one another to optimize the nuclease for its particular function. So, for example, if we're interested in making an Arcus enzyme that we're going to deliver using AAV, we know in that case the AAV is going to persist in the cell for a long time. So the Arcus is going to be expressed for a long period of time in the cell, days, weeks, months. So we're going to err on the side of making an Arcus enzyme that cuts very slowly and very carefully because we want to minimize the likelihood that that enzyme is going to find some off-target site in the cell to cut. Conversely, if we're using a lipid nanoparticle to deliver our Arcus enzyme, in that case we get a very short burst of expression, just a few hours or, or maybe a day. So we're going to err on the side of making an Arcus enzyme that's a lot more active, that works a lot faster, because it has a lot less time to get the job done. Our overall workflow for making a new Arcus nuclease looks like this. It starts with lead generation. And the first step in that process is we identify a site, or more often a group of sites, in a gene that we're interested in modifying. And those sites that are amenable to being cut and edited by an Arcus nuclease. We then use two different protein engineering techniques to re-engineer the surface of IQRI1 that I showed you on the previous slide to make it recognize a new DNA sequence. Those two techniques are in silico protein design, which involves modeling structures of the protein on the computer, and directed evolution, which is an experimental method in which we screen large mutant libraries to find mutants of IQRI1 that recognize the DNA sequence we're interested in. We use those two techniques to engineer the surface, and that gets us to a first-generation Arcus nuclease. The first-generation enzyme will generally cut its intended target site with high efficiency, but will also cut some number of off-target sites in the genome that we don't want. At that point, our lead nuclease goes into the lead optimization process. And this starts with a very thorough characterization of off-target editing. And based on what we find, we introduce additional changes into the first generation enzyme to improve the specificity and eliminate the off-target gene editing. That gets us to a second generation Arcus nuclease. We then repeat this process two to three times generally. And usually about generation four or generation five, we have an Arcus enzyme that has the desired therapeutic index, and that is our clinical candidate nuclease. The clinical candidate is an enzyme that cuts the intended target site with high efficiency, but doesn't cut any concerning off-target sites to a degree that we can detect. The first part of the process, the, the lead generation, everything prior to getting to that, that first generation Arcus, that takes us about five weeks. And then the lead optimization process generally takes anywhere from six months to a year, depending on how many cycles we have to take it through. So a question that I get asked all the time is, if Arcus is so great, why does everybody use CRISPR? And the reason is shown on the screen. There's a very significant upfront investment in time and resources to make every Arcus nuclease. And I'm pretty sure we're the only group that can actually do this. So it's a technology that just isn't accessible to the vast majority of the research community. It's not nearly as easy as just changing out the guide RNA in a CRISPR. And there are dozens of online services that'll make a CRISPR in a couple of days. But what I'm gonna show you in the next few slides 
is why that upfront investment in Arcus is so worthwhile. A couple of themes you're going to see throughout the rest of the talk. One is precision, the other is versatility. Precision, what we're talking about here is safety and specificity or the avoidance of off-target gene editing, which obviously is very important for any editing-based therapy. But probably less obvious is versatility. And what I mean here is there are a lot of ways to knock a gene out in the liver. You can do it with Arcus, you can do it with CRISPR, with zinc finger, base editing, prime editing. But there's a limited number of diseases that we can treat by knocking out a gene in the liver. For everything else, you need an editing technology that has the properties of Arcus. In particular, two properties that I want to highlight. One is Arcus is easy to deliver. Lipid nanoparticles are terrific for delivering to the liver. For everything else, at least today, the only real option is AAV. So you need a technology that's compatible with AAV, and Arcus is. The other property that Arcus has is it's able to perform complex edits. So it's not just a tool for knocking genes out. We can use Arcus to knock genes in. And ultimately, that's what we want to be able to do. We want to be able to knock genes in, because the vast majority of rare genetic diseases are actually caused by the absence of something that the cell needs. What we want to be able to do is provide the cell with a copy of that gene that's defective to compensate for the one that's in its genome that isn't working. So let's talk first about safety. Arcus is unique among the gene editing technologies in that it has the ability to turn itself off. The enzyme actually exists in two different configurations. There's a closed configuration, which is what's shown on this slide. That's the inactive form of the enzyme. In this configuration, the active side of the enzyme is actually tucked up inside the middle of the protein so it can't access or cut the DNA. But in the presence of its target DNA site, the enzyme opens up. And now the active site becomes exposed, and the enzyme becomes active and able to cut the DNA target. And then once it cuts and edits its target, the enzyme closes back up again. It goes back into the default inactive form. The reason this matters is it allows us to express an Arcus nuclease in a cell for an extended period of time, for example, from an AAV vector, without having to worry about that cell accumulating off-target editing over time. And we have demonstrated this over and over again in long-term non-human primate studies, in which we use AAV to deliver Arcus to a primate, and we track the editing profile over time the on-target editing as well as the off-target editing. What we find is the editing profile that we see at three years following administration of the vector looks more or less the same as the editing profile that we saw at two weeks. So despite the continued expression of the Arcus nuclease in the cells, we don't see any off-target editing accumulating over time, presumably because the enzyme is being made, but it's being made in the default inactive form. On the topic of off-target editing, I, I want to get on my soapbox for just a moment here and give Precision's perspectives on off-target editing and the importance of being able to detect it. The number of off-target sites that are identified for, for any gene editing nuclease, whether it's Arcus, or CRISPR, or zinc finger, is a function of how well those off-target edits can be detected. And off-target sites are very, very difficult to detect for most gene editing platforms. This is particularly true of something like a base editor, 
that doesn't leave much of a signature behind at the off-target sites that can be detected after the fact. And if you can detect better, you can engineer a better editing enzyme, meaning we can't fix the off-target editing that we don't know about. We are very, very fortunate that Arcus, in fact, does leave a very clear signature behind when it cuts off target sites in the genome, and that allows us to find them. And more often than not, when we find off target editing, we're able to redesign the enzyme to fix it. The method that we use in house to, de to detect off target editing is something that we developed that we call oligo capture. And the way it works is, is like this. We, we transfect a population of cells with a gene encoding an Arcus enzyme, as well as a very high concentration of a DNA tag. The Arcus enzyme get, gets made in the cells, and it, it cuts its sites in the genome. It cuts the on-target site, and it also cuts any off-target sites that it might have. And then that DNA tag ends up getting captured at the sites of all of those breaks, whether they're on target or off target. We can then use NGS to figure out where in the genome that tag landed. And we can deep sequence those sites one at a time to figure out which ones represent bona fide off target cut sites by Arcus and what the frequency of those off target cuts actually is. This looks a lot like a method called GuideSeq that was developed for CRISPR. It's really the, the gold standard method for detecting off-targeting with CRISPR. The really, really important difference, though, between oligocapture and GuideSeq is, as you can see on this slide, the DNA tag that we use has four base, three prime overhangs that are complementary to the overhangs made by Arcus. What that means is that DNA tag tends to be captured preferentially at sites of bona fide off-target editing by Arcus, as opposed to being captured at sites of, of DNA breaks that just happen to be in the genome because of UV irradiation or cell division or, or sort of everyday metabolism. A DNA break that's introduced by a CRISPR is more or less indistinguishable from a break made by UV radiation. That gives the CRISPR methods a really high degree of background and a really poor signal-to-noise ratio. With Arcus, the signal-to-noise ratio is much, much better, which gives us the ability to detect off-targeting with much higher efficiency. Our collaborators at the University of Pennsylvania actually demonstrated this. Uh, they used both techniques. They used GuideSeq, which is the, the gold standard CRISPR method, and oligocapture to detect the sites of off-target editing in non-human primates that were treated with an Arcus enzyme directed against the PCSK9 gene. What they found was GuideSeq was able to detect one off-target site, whereas oligocapture was able to detect that off-target site and six more. So the gold standard method for CRISPR, in fact, failed to detect six out of seven legitimate off-target sites. This is not to say that the CRISPR groups aren't doing everything they possibly can to identify off-target gene editing. What I am saying is that technology has an inherent blind spot that makes off-target editing hard to find. With Arcus, we are very fortunate that we can better understand, better characterize our product. And at the end of the day, that's what we want. Because if we know where the off-target editing is, more often than not, we can fix it. Let's talk now about the versatility of the technology. Arcus is small, and that makes it very easy to deliver. It's by far the smallest of the gene editing enzymes. It's a fraction of the size of even the new microCAS9s. The gene that encodes an Arcus enzyme is about 1,000 base pairs long, meaning that even with promoters and polyadenylation signals and, and, and all the parts that we need to express the enzyme in a cell, 
we can fit multiple Arcus enzymes into a single AAV vector and still get high titer full length virus. That is very, very difficult and, and in most cases impossible with the other editing technologies. And so what you typically see, insofar as AAV is used to deliver any of the other technologies, the nuclease has to be split between two, sometimes even three AAV vectors, all of which have to be delivered to the same cell at the same time, which obviously is a significant complication for any therapeutic program. All right, one, one final unique property that Arcus has that I want to spend some time talking about. When we introduce a DNA cut, into the genome using a, a gene editing nuclease. That DNA cut can be repaired by two different mechanisms. The first mechanism, shown here on the left, is called non-homologous end joining, or NHEJ. This is the cell's sort of quick and dirty DNA repair mechanism. When a break is repaired by non-homologous end joining, what we typically see is small sort of random insertion and deletion mutations that we call indels get introduced into the cut site. That is a terrific way to knock a gene out. And all of the gene editing technologies are good at doing that. But the more interesting pathway is the one shown here on the right. That's homology-directed repair, or HDR. In this case, we actually make a DNA molecule that we call the repair template and we give that to the cell. The HDR process then fixes the DNA break by recombining the chromosome that we just cut with the repair template, such that the sequence of the repair template gets inserted permanently into the chromosome. That is a great way of inserting new genes into the genome or repairing a gene that's defective. Arcus is really good at doing the one on the right. Remember, I, I, I told you in the beginning that the iCRE1 enzyme that Arcus is based on, it, its job in nature is to insert a new gene into the algae genome. The way it does that is it stimulates DNA repair by HDR. And the way it stimulates HDR is it makes a very particular type of DNA cut. It makes a cut that has a four base, three prime overhang. Three prime overhangs act as a kind of a signal to the cell that that DNA break needs to be repaired through HDR instead of NHEJ. And this effect is already pretty well established in the scientific literature, but one of our scientists came up with a very elegant way of demonstrating this, and I, I want to show this to you because it's, it's cool data. Um, so what he did is he used Precision's process for making CAR T cells. He started with a, a population of activated T cells and introduced into them an Arcus enzyme that recognizes and cuts a DNA sequence in a gene called track. He then introduced into the cell a repair template encoding a gene called a CAR. That, that's the purple sequence that you see in the repair template. And 49.4% of the time, the DNA break in the track locus was repaired through HDR with our repair template such that the CAR gene was integrated stably into the genome in track. With lower frequency, 20.7% of the time, that DNA break was repaired through non-homologous end joining and, and an indel was introduced into the track gene. So, DNA breaks with three prime overhangs are repaired preferentially by HDR. He then repeated this experiment, exact same experiment, with one change. He added an enzyme called a three prime exonuclease, which is the the purple Pac-Man thing on the slide. That purple Pac-Man eats three prime overhangs. So now he introduced this into the cell and, and the Arcus enzyme cut the track locus and, and made a three prime overhang, but then the exonuclease chewed the overhangs off to give us blunt ends that look like a DNA break made by a CRISPR. 
Now, the frequency of homology-directed repair dropped off very significantly. Only 6.6 percent .6 of the cells had DNA uh, repair by HDR and acquired the CAR gene in the track locus. The vast majority of cells, 58 percent, had the DNA break repaired by non-homologous end joining and the introduction of an indel. So, blunt end cut repaired primarily by non-homologous end joining. The exact same experiment, the only difference is the presence or absence of those three prime overhangs. And what you see is it has a huge impact on the editing outcome. What we care about at the end of the day is the ratio of HDR to NHEJ. So the ratio of what we do want to what we don't want. And there's about a 20-fold enhancement in favor of HDR when we use Arcus and make cuts with three prime overhangs. Therefore, we really do think that Arcus is the perfect technology for making complex edits like gene insertion.